Right, uh, we're going to make a start. Thank you all very much for coming. My name's uh, Matthew Beaumont, and I'm a professor in the English department here at UCL. Uh, and I'm very briefly just going to welcome you here uh, as part of the Cities Imaginaries strand, which is a component of the urban lab here at UCL. It was founded uh, two or three years ago as a way of curating a rolling... Uh, often ad hoc program of arts-related events in all sorts of media uh, as a way of thinking about the city and its, its representations in all sorts of geographical and, and historical contexts. Uh, we inaugurated this strand of the Urban Lab uh, with a lecture by uh, Amit Chowdhury, and last year he was followed by Linton Kwesi Johnson. So watch this space for, uh, for future events. We have an annual lecture. Those were the speakers for this lecture. Uvashi is going to uh, be this year's uh, City's Imaginary Speaker, I'm very glad to say. And she is going to be welcomed by Pushpa. But before her, Maria is going to uh, introduce the India Voices season. Thanks so much for coming. And I'm just going to take one minute of your time to highlight yellow posters you should be seeing um, around UCL. Um, basically, Grand Challenges and Global Engagement Office and various other programs have come together for the 70th anniversary of Indian independence to run a whole host of programs under the tagline of India Voices. You can see on one of the logos, the various logos which are floating around on here. So this lecture is also tagged India Voices. If you can put the 21st of June afternoon, early evening into your diaries, there's going to be a festival with academics speaking to the work, work that they're doing in India across the six grand challenges. But there also is going to be drinks and food and people coming together and hopefully also some student societies taking part. So I hope to see as many as possible there. And if you want more information on India Voices, just Google UCL India Voices and the whole program, which has movies and talks, and this festival will pop up and you can register for it and all come along. Thank you very much. Okay, now for the, maybe the easy or the hard part of uh, introducing somebody like Urvashi Butalia. Um, when we first decided to approach Urvashi Butalia for an, with an invitation to give this year's Cities Imaginaries annual lecture, I actually had a moment of panic. I didn't know how to get in touch with her, and I was afraid that I might have to go through some self-important agent who might say that her calendar is full for the next year, and, you know, how would I convince her, and how would I even be able to have a chat with her directly? And it was just by chance that I found her Gmail ID on the internet. It was actually at the, um, on the EPW article that she wrote a few years ago. And I just decided to write to her directly and see what she says. And her modesty was very humbling because within a few hours she replied very quickly and she said she would be delighted to give this lecture. And since then she has been nothing but accommodating as we have worked to make today's, tonight's lecture a reality. So in an almost reversal of roles, she has catered to every whim of ours, and from the date to the topic, and we are delighted that she will be speaking about Mona's story tonight, a tale that first appeared in Grantha in 2011. She, she, she's an ethnographer, and she collects stories, and so she has many layers of uh, narratives to peel through characters like Mona, and I think she will be um, enriching us tonight with uh, what she has uh, in terms of an immense amount of material uh, that she has piled in the decades. Um, so how do we introduce somebody like Urvashi? Um, if you look at many um, introductions, most write-ups have a very clear epithet. It says she's a feminist writer, historian, and a publisher. In a way, it tells quite a lot about you, but I thought it doesn't tell enough because in reality, you actually studied literature um, at Delhi University in the early 70s, and you eventually set up India's first feminist publishing house in 1984, Kali for Women. This was followed in 2003 by when you started Zuban Books as an imprint of Kali for Women, and you continue to publish books on, for, by, and about women in South Asia. 
And what is notable about this publishing house is also the way it tries to break some of the hegemony that we have in India about the English language and creating a space for vernacular writing. It's still a, quite a big barrier that publishing houses try to overcome in India. And I like some of the discussions that you've ha held in the press and the public domain about translations of works by um, uh, Hindi and non-English speaking writers. Um, and the other notable thing is at one point in our conversations, uh, Urvashi warned me that she's not an academic and she is an activist. And I told her that this is precisely why we would like to have her here tonight. Um, um, most of you who are involved in UCL academic research in some point, uh, somehow, some way or the other, you might find yourselves at a hard corner where we are eager to connect our work to a community that is outside of the university. And so what we try to do is many of us try to embrace the role of an activist and we try to draw verbose jargon, some uh, academic uh, complex theories, and we try to join community organizations in support of a more radical emancipatory role. And we've been trying to do that through the UCL Urban Laboratory in many ways. And we set up for sometimes for some kind of awkward engagements as well between academia and activism. So in many ways, I thought it's perhaps appropriate to go back and hear from an activist how to get our hands dirty in the real field. And so we hope that you know, your story today will tell us many things about being an activist and more than an activist in India today. Um, so all over to you, Urvashi, and thank you very much. Thank you, Pushpa. It's so nice to have an introduction which is not Wikipedia. <laughs> she is a reader in the College of Vocational Studies. No, no, that's not what I am. I'm not a reader there. She has done something. She acts as consultant to Oxfam. No, it's not true. But I don't know where it came from. She has a significant other with whom she started her feminist publishing house. No, not true. But it's on Wikipedia. So <laughs> Uh, okay, thank you Pushpa, thank you Matthew, Ben, Jordan for everything. I do have a written paper, I'm going to read from it because in, I don't know, as I get older I get panicked about speaking and start writing my papers which I never did before. Then I get stuck with a written script. So let me start by saying, ladies and gentlemen, and all those other identities that lie in between. Thank you all for being here. I want to flag this talk about Mona Ahmed, a transgender, a trans woman, by mentioning how the privilege of friendship with Mona has taught me many things. One of them has to do with language and how important it is to be inclusive and through language to make visible all those other identities which we otherwise forget which is why I quite deliberately choose to say ladies, gentlemen, and all those other identities that lie in between. Before I begin to tell you Mona's story, I'd like you to meet her. You've all seen the rather wonderful poster that Pushpa and her colleagues prepared, but I still like you to look at it, and Jordan will tell me what to do, how to do that. This is Mona at age possibly 20, just after her castration and her sex reassignment surgery. The usual swimsuit photo taken in a studio. This is Mona in her home today. She's lying under her quilt. And at the back over there, you see that large portrait which is a picture of hers, just her face, which she's had blown up and mounted and which moves to different parts of her room. But it's quite imposing with those eyes looking out over Mona sleeping. This is Mona smiling for all of you because I told her that I'd be talking about her. And she said, take a picture of me as a greeting to all the people who will come to listen. This is Mona today. She's nearly 81 years old, quite different from the swimsuit picture that you saw earlier. 
And then this is Mona in her heyday, singing and dancing, which she used to do. And this picture of hers is a poster, and the picture is taken by Dayanita Singh, a photographer. And what you see at the side are pictures of Mona today. The one in the top left-hand corner is Mona with Dayanita's mother. The one right below that is Mona with her guru, Chaman. And the one below that, which is all faded, is um, Mona at age 20, also a studio photo. The rest of them are street scenes that she likes and she likes to keep. So this is Mona today. Because this talk is located within the ambit of the city imaginaries, I'd like to tell you a little bit about where Mona lives. Her home is in the heart of Delhi in a graveyard. This is where we first met many years ago at a birthday party. I know all this sounds very dramatic, birthday parties and graveyards don't really go together, but in some strange way, this closeness of death and birth have stayed with Mona and I in the many years that we have known each other. I'll tell you a bit more about this as we go along. The place where Mona lives is called Mehindia. At one time, a clump of Mehindi, that is henna, bushes stood at its heart. Today, perhaps only one tree is left, or one bush is left, but the name has stuck. Local lore, if local lore is to be believed, and I've not really been able to find any corroboration of this in books, but everyone in that area says this. This area once housed a sect called Jamia Rehemia, set up in the 19th century by a man who came from Persia. The sect, supposedly a religious one, died out with him and was then reinvented by someone completely different and the compound was once again populated. In 1947, when India became independent and, part and partition happened, most people living there, Muslims, fled. In time, as things settled down, some of them returned and occupied the space. Some new people moved in, building houses on top of the graves. Mona is given to saying, here the dead made way for the living. Mehindia also currently houses the offices of an organization called Markazi Jamiat Ulema e Hind, which is part of a larger Muslim organization called Jamiat Ulema e Hind, which was set up in 1919 and whose founders did not believe that Hindus and Muslims should be at odds with each other, that they were different types of people, and these founders were opposed to partition. Some remaining members of this sect, because this is now a breakaway group from a larger sect, still meet the first Sunday of every month in this place with others of a secular bent of mind, and they talk about the need for Hindu-Muslim unity, a rare and precious thing in India today. Until recently, the group also produced an Urdu newspaper, calligraphed by hand, but today technology has taken over and whatever communication has to be uh, done is done on the internet. Today this compound is a bustling, busy place with small shops bordering it, which offer provisions, juices, hot rotis and dal, photocopying, phone recharges, and all the other things that make up the small economies of a city. Nearby there are shanties that house a large market of secondhand furniture, and then a space that houses hundreds of rickshaw pullers who live there, some sleeping in their rickshaws at night, and some parking themselves on the ground. Meat shops, now rapidly disappearing as Hindu fever grips India, and love of the cow becomes paramount. Many of these shops sold cow meat under the counter. They exist, but their existence is now quite precarious. Their owners fear for their lives and are unable to sell meat openly because they could be attacked at any time. In the new Hindu-dominated India where you cannot eat what you want, meat shops are dangerous. The area, like much of old Delhi even now, is largely Muslim. It's also largely poor. When I first went there on my own many years ago, I think over 23 or 24 years ago, 
I have to say that despite my thinking of myself as an open secular person minus prejudices, I was actually quite scared. I felt vulnerable. I belonged to a different class. I drove a car. I thought I knew my city, but I realized entering Mona's space, which is really in the center of town, how little I did know it. In Delhi at one time, it was difficult to escape the pervasive presence of poverty. But as the city has grown and as its middle classes have built themselves into gated communities, the poor impinge less and less on our lives and it's easy enough to ignore their presence. When I began going to see Mona, I came across people who lived marginal lives in ways that I had not even ever imagined and I'm ashamed to say this. The people I met included grave diggers, knife sharpeners, ambulance drivers, sex workers, beggars, refugees. At first I did not know what to make of them and sometimes seeing the overtly Muslim character of the place, I felt quite threatened. It's sad but true how we internalize prejudice. Over the years as I began to go there regularly, it has become a comfortable, familiar space and now I know everyone there, everyone knows me and we are friends. This to me is a precious gift in an atmosphere where identities have become so polarized. Mona herself is a much more recent inhabitant, but like most of the people in Mahindia, she's also a sort of squatter. She came here because she was homeless and she established her right by laying claim, as most people did there, to a few graves that she said belonged to her ancestors. Since there are no longer any headstones to mark the old graves, no one knows to whom they belong. But Mona decided they belonged to her ancestors. She covered them with a sequined cloth, put a few flowers on them and lay down next to them. And soon this space became her home. In time, it sprouted walls, a sort of room, some tentative structures. She put down a bed and a mattress and it became a space to live in. Although, as with much of Mona's life, it remains quite incomplete. The back wall of the structures she built touched the wall of the morgue of a Delhi hospital. And Mona is given to saying, knowing full well the impact her words will have on people, I have the dead behind me and the dead beneath me. It's a good way to live. Mehindia houses three graveyards. There used to be two, there's now a third. Two madrasas. At one end, there are large huts, makeshift huts, which house giant washing machines, which until recently ran on stolen electricity, which wash linen for some of the luxury hotels nearby. Some parts of the compound are rented out to large batteries that are housed there when they're not in use for street events such as weddings and celebrations. There's also a ground normally used for sport where you can see young boys in skull caps playing cricket or learning taekwondo but on occasion this ground is transformed into a parking space where the locals hire out parking for cricket matches that take place nearby and they can accommodate the spillover and earn good money in the two or three days that the matches take place. It was here that I met Mona. The birthday party that I mentioned was in many ways the strangest party I have ever been to. Mona was celebrating the sixth birthday of her adopted daughter Aisha and she had generously and flamboyantly invited all and sundry. Rather than issue invitations as any of us might do, she had had them printed in bulk and had employed people to plaster them all over the walls of the old city. So as we drove in, we saw plenty of these posters lining the route, pasted on the walls all around. The day was the 26th of January, India's Republic Day, the day on which India, more than half a century ago, had become a republic, half a century ago then. Mona had quite deliberately chosen this day as the birth, as the birth day of her daughter, because as she said then, she will be free like India. Nearly 150 people came to the celebration, which was in full swing when we arrived, with food being cooked in large vats, the delicious aroma of fried pakoras and meat curry and hot rotis filling the air. People were the kind of crowd that people like me, middle class Indians who live in relative, lives of relative privilege, never get to meet on a day-to-day -day basis. 
We may interact with them in terms of work, but we do not socialize with them. For me, this party was a revelation, the first of many. I went there along with a friend, a well-known photographer called Dayanita Singh, who has documented Mona's life, and with a group of other people. At the time, I was working on a book on partition and wanted to talk to people on the margins of society who had lived through that time. Mona had been about 10 in 1947, and she had some memories of the time, so Dayanita suggested that I speak to her. Mona welcomed me to the party, but it seemed to me right away that there was something amiss. Large and imposing, her cropped, henard hair spiking every which way, Mona was not really dressed for a party. Her clothes were a mess, her hair disheveled, and the subject of the party, Aisha, was absent. Mona told us that a few days before the party, Aisha had been abducted by her grandmother, Chaman, and that she had thrown this very public party in order to shame Chaman into returning the girl. This did not happen. Aisha didn't turn up, and Mona was deeply unhappy. But she was the hostess. She had to perform her role. Most of the guests at the party were male, although there were some women as well. And Mona talked to them all, to the men as bhai, brother, and with the women as baji or behenji, sister. Now Ahmed, and Bhai, now Mona and Baji, no one found this anything but normal. This quick and constant switching of identities, everybody took for granted. At some point, mindful of the reason I had gone to see her, Mona took me aside and talked to me about partition, and I took notes. Later, the story she told me would find its way into a book I wrote. At the time, I was happy to meet her, intrigued at what I had seen, but that was it. I moved on to other things. And then one day, perhaps it was two or three weeks after this event, Mona called me. Since I was a writer, she said, would I like to write her life? I was intrigued, curious, somewhat excited, somewhat unsure. But I went along to see her. We began talking. I took notes, recorded some things she said. She wrote some things herself. We settled on a regular day to meet, Sundays. So every Sunday when I was in Delhi, I would go to see her. I'd spend a couple of hours with her. We would talk. It's been over 20 years now. And the book that I was planning to write on Mona's life or that she wanted me to write has become a thing of the past. I don't think I'll ever do it. But we've become friends. And every Sunday we meet and talk. And every Sunday when I'm out of town, like yesterday when I was in a flight, I have to warn Mona and alert her that I will not be coming that Sunday to see her. Mona Ahmed was born a boy. She was the third child in her family after two girls in 1947. In 1937, that's when she was born. In the narrow, congested streets of Bali Maran in Old Delhi, where her father ran a small business selling skull caps, her birth was greeted with joy. The family could no longer be dismissed. They now had a boy to continue the line. But things didn't quite turn out as expected. Here's Mona speaking. From the moment I became conscious of myself as a person, I felt I was a misfit. I was convinced that I had been born in the wrong body. I really, really wanted to be a girl. It wasn't only the physical fact of her maleness that made Mona uncomfortable, but also the cultural baggage that accompanied it. She liked dolls and feminine things. She preferred girls as friends. This made her the butt of many jokes at school, as well as a source of anxiety for her parents. She was a lonely child, an outcast among the boys who saw her as effeminate, yet unable to join the girls because the society in which she lived was deeply conservative. There was no space for girls and boys to play together. She often left home for school, but instead spent the day sitting in the park alone. It was not until much later in life that she would find what she believed was a place for herself. When I was around 10, Mona said, in 1947, my family moved to Pakistan. But later we came back here. I was unable to get admission in a school, and my parents were quite concerned about my girlishness. So the Molana was brought in to teach me. He would read the Quran to me. One day the Molana molested me. I remember the terrible pain. I was bleeding and hurting. I told my mother, who told my grandmother, Later, they told my father. Then my grandmother and father, they beat up the Molana. 
At first he admitted that he had done this, but later he swore that he had not. So my father then punished me by sending me back to him. I hated it. I was frightened of him. My mother fought with my father about this, but he refused to change. He was adamant. He insisted that the fault was mine. Little has changed today, 70 years on, where this kind of thing is concerned. Mona was sent back to school, but nothing changed. She only ever had female friends. She would play female roles in plays at school. The boys and the older men in her neighborhood teased her, making her the subject of many jokes. People would say to her, Aapa hai, bhai nahi hai. She's a sister, not a brother. At 18, Mona met the hijras who would become her soulmates and her family, who would, in other words, change her life. A group of them had come to a nearby home to bless a newborn child and sing and dance in exchange for money. The offering, this offering of blessings is one of the traditional occupations of the hijras. The city is divided up between groups of hijras who claim certain territories for their own, and they build an extensive network of the underclass, the gardeners, the house guards, the domestics, the shopkeepers, and more, who keep them informed of births and marriages and new jobs, new homes, and all kinds of auspicious and happy occasions. They then arrive and offer to bless the person in return for money, and if the money is not forthcoming, they will heap curses upon you, playing upon people's fears, and in the old days, they would also threaten to expose their supposedly ma maimed and abnormal bodies, particularly their genitals, and frighten people into paying. And most people were frightened in into paying. Immediately she saw the hijras, Mona felt a shock of recognition. These are my people, she thought, men who want to become women. She followed them to the tea stall and struck up a conversation. They recognized a kindred spirit. Several meetings later, after a particularly traumatic encounter with her father, Mona went to them in desperation. They offered her an escape. Come with us, they said, we'll help you. Mona didn't hesitate. Tempted by the hijra's promise of a nearly female identity, she left home and traveled to Bombay, where she lived with a troop and prepared for her castration, a procedure known in the hijra community as nirvana. I didn't actually need much preparation, she told me. I had already decided I hated all those genitalia. She used the little money she had. The hijras helped with the rest. They look after their own, she said. Mona's penis and testicles were removed in a backroom surgery in Belapur, a small village near Bombay. The peripheries of many cities in India house inside the hutments that form poor people's homes a whole alternative life of sex work, drugs, money laundering, and quack doctors performing such surgeries. At the time, in the late 50s, sexual reassignment surgery was illegal in India and unregulated. In Mona's case, the local anesthetic did not work very well, and the pain was agonizing. Afterwards, she told me, I felt an enormous sense of liberation. But at the time, all I could think of was the pain. Much later, when Mona and I got to know each other and she learned to tell me other stories, she said that although she'd always wanted to be female, she had actually not been prepared for the finality of castration. Suddenly, she said, I realized that I had crossed the point of no return. There was now no going back. In the early days, Mona was happy with the hijras. She was treated well. She was taught to sing and dance, skills that would become her route to earning money later. It was a wonderful life, she said. We'd dress up in nice clothes, go out to sing, dance, offer blessings. She felt increasingly that she had landed among her own kind, that her sexuality was finally not in question. I thought, she said, I thought I'd found a home. But new homes are not so easily found, nor old ones left behind. Despite the violence and insults she had endured for her family, Mona's connection to them remained strong. She refused to give them up, worrying about her sisters, and later even offering to pay for their children's education. She kept going back to her home, in some ways seeking acceptance for who she was from her family. Whenever she went home, she would dress in male clothes and would revert to her name, Ahmed. And once back with the hijras, she would become Mona. 
and the glittery, colorful shalwar kameezes would take over. These easy, fluid switches of identity were, I learned later, part of Mona's life, and it took me quite some time to come to terms with them. Mona's closeness to her family, her desire to maintain her connections with them, these things did not popularize her among the hijras, who follow a strict code once they have achieved nirvana. They become part of a larger hijra family and the more immediate family of their guru, and all ties with the natal family are severed. Mona's refusal to fall in line with this created a great deal of tension in her community, and there were many falling outs. On one of these occasions, Mona did the impermissible thing. She took her complaint against her guru to the police. For this, the guru threw, threw her out, and for some time she became homeless, sleeping wherever she could find shelter in the city, in the streets of Delhi. Delhi has a number of shelters for the homeless, and she would sometimes sleep in one of these, and sometimes just on park benches. She also took to drink whenever she could find money, and on some days ended up inside the walls of Mahindia, which is where she eventually made her home. Years later, in an attempt to deal with her despair at the loss of her daughter, Mona went on the Hajj pilgrimage. I asked her if she went as a man or a woman. As a man, of course, she told me, women cannot undertake the Hajj on their own. At the time, I wanted to ask her more, but I did not dare. Later, when we got to know each other better and began to share things about our lives, I did ask. Where did you sleep, I wanted to know, in the men's quarters or the women's quarters? In the men's quarters, of course, she told me. But how then did she use the toilet? Shortly after she was castrated, Mona underwent what must have been one of the first sexual reassignment surgeries in India, so that her body then was that of a female. She had breasts and a vagina. So how could she use the men's toilet? Oh, she said nonchalantly, I went to the women's toilet. But how did you explain to them, I asked. Didn't anyone ask her what a man was doing there? Because she came from the men's quarters. She wasn't living in the women's quarters. She was dressed in men's clothes. So how could she do this? No, no, she said. If they did, I would just clap and they would know. I don't know how many of you know, but hijras in India use this open-handed clap like this to identify themselves. And clearly, the women understood the language of the hands. So Mona was allowed into the women's toilet. Once she had established herself in Mahindia, Mona became a sort of point of contact for all kinds of people. By the time I met her, her home was filled with all kinds of itinerants, some who stayed longer than others. But she wasn't only that. Some days at her home, I'd meet groups of young men, slicked back hair, shiny pointy shoes, skin-tight trousers, and an almost elusive sense of femaleness. She introduced me to them, Jugnu, Chand, Ankit, Dharminder, but it wasn't until I'd met them a few times that I began to understand what I was seeing. Young men transitioning, if one can use that word, from maleness to femaleness. Can one use that word, Sunil? You can, right? They'd come to Mona for advice and support. There's really no one else who can help us to understand, they told me. That's why we come to Baji. Some of them had begun to take hormones and you could see their faces becoming smooth, their body hair starting to drop off. One of them even looked as if he was beginning to grow breasts. His friends teased him gently and I thought a shade enviously about this. Another day, Mona stood waiting for me as I arrived at Mahindia. Let's go, she said, lifting herself into my car and leaning forward to turn on the air conditioner full blast. Where, I asked her, she told me not to ask questions and directed me across the old iron bridge on the river Yamuna to a part of Delhi called Silampur. We're going to Dart, she said. Dart turned out to be an NGO funded by the Delhi government whose main business was AIDS prevention and it sent out groups of young boys to places where men sought sexual partners to distribute free condoms. But every Sunday afternoon, Dart transformed into something else, a space where men and transsexuals and hijras came together to cross-dress and to sing and dance. I met a man in a sari who offered me a cup of tea and introduced himself as an engineer working in a large corporation. It's a corporation called Voltas, which is a, uh, an amalgamation of a Swiss company called Volkart and the Tatas. 
so in, in Volkart, who was married and with two children. I come here most Sundays, he said, my wife knows, and she thinks it's okay for me to express the female part of myself. It also helps us to be friends. Another frequent visitor at Mona's home was an old man, slightly bent over and frail, a tattered kefia wound around his head, who sold homemade biscuits in the streets of Old Delhi. He's also a hij, she once told me. If you lift up his clothes, you'll see. A challenge to which I did not rise. So. What was it with all these men wanting to be women, I wondered. Here I was, a woman who thinks of herself as empathetic, quite open, surrounded by men who were doing their best to switch over to my side, and I felt out of place, as if I did not belong. I was reminded of a conversation I'd once had with an Australian friend of mine, a lesbian and a feminist, as she and I stood and watched some hijras dance at a women's health conference. I hate all this, she said to me. We fought so long and hard to carve out a little space for ourselves in society, to be able to make our voices heard, and then here are these men pretending to be women, and they've come to take it over. Until she said it in so many words, I hadn't actually thought of it like that. Instead, I'd been wondering about what the experience of maleness and female meant for the Monas of this world and how someone like me could understand it. Typically, Mona had the answer. Are, she said to me, why do you worry so much about this? What is there to think? I'm human, you're human. I'm a woman, sometimes I can be a man. I don't like being one, but sometimes it's useful. And anyway, we have something more in common, and that is that both you and I, we are bachelors. <laughs> so. Mona might have been a bachelor, but she was also that other thing that bachelors are not, a mother. This was something she had always desperately wanted, and in this chaman, the guru indulged her. I asked her about this. Why would she, someone who'd been a man, want to be a mother? What was it that attracted her? She answered in her usual direct fashion. Why, she said to me, why do people think motherhood can only be biological? It's an argument we feminists make all the time, but it's strange to have a man throw it back at you, or a man who's become a woman throw it back at you. She yearned to experience motherhood. It was the only way, she said, that a woman could be complete. I never quite knew what to make of these statements of Mona's, motherhood being the only way a woman could be complete. Did she really believe that? Shortly after my father died, Mona came home to condole with my mother. Dressed in resplendent white, she walked in and sat with my mother, held her hand and sympathized, saying she knew what it was like to be a woman alone. My mother, a fierce feminist, acknowledged this sympathy with the respect it deserved but the irony was not lost on her or on any one of us. And so the hijras helped Mona fulfill her desire for a child, but even here, identities were typically jumbled up. As it happened, a neighbor of Mona's died in childbirth, and her widower was reluctant to keep the child a girl. Mona Chaman, her guru, and Nargis, one of Chaman's disciples and Mona's colleague or friend, uh, took the child in, forming a family, with Chaman becoming Dadi, grandmother, although Chaman has always only identified as male transgender. Mona was Abu, father, although all the, by that time she had become physically female, and Nargis became Ami, mother. They made a family and they adopted the child. The real role of mother was played by Mona, however. She visited pediatricians and midwives to learn how to hold, burp, wash, care for, and bring up the child. Until the age of six, the birthday celebrated at the graveyard, Aisha was raised by Mona. But Chaman grew jealous of the growing affection between Mona and the girl, and he grew critical of it. His authority was being undermined because in the Hijra family, you cannot actually build connections that are not sanctioned by the family. His instructions were being flouted. Mona listened to doctors, she went to normal people, not to him, and the child and mother seemed to share a bond that effectively left him out. He decided to separate them. With his customary authority, Chaman took Aisha away from Mona. Mona, fierce in her attachment, fought hard to retain the child, but she did not succeed. It was this despair that led to her alcoholism and her desire to go on a religious pilgrimage. As a footnote, or as a note to this, 
uh, I'd like to tell you that Aisha, now grown up uh, and married, uh, talks about her growing up in her household of hijras who had turned themselves into family for her. And she speaks very movingly of growing up in a household which is an all-woman household, more or less, because everybody, more or less, other than Chaman, identifies as a woman, but not having a woman to talk to about the changes that were happening to her body and how to understand them. And she said to me, can you imagine growing up not knowing what's happening to your body, having a household full of people who look like women, and nobody can tell you anything about what's happening to you. Which is why she moved on to build her own life. It took several years for Mona to accept the fact that Aisha would not be returning to her, that there was no way for her to reclaim her child. Gradually, her store of love and the desire for motherhood gave way to a sort of indifference. She looked forward to the child's visits, but with each non-appearance, something inside her died. Aisha is a young woman in her 20s today. She's married, and she's moved away from both Mona and Chaman, and is living her own life. As I said earlier, Mona's home became a sort of space of shelter for all sorts of people. I met a man there called Akbar, who was from Manipur, dressed in slick black trousers and a silky, slithery shirt, buttons open to his chest, Akbar was an itinerant who'd left his family back home, packed a small trunk, and he now lived on one of the stone slabs in Mona's courtyard, teaching the young boys in the madrasa taekwondo and karate. Often in the evenings, I would see young boys in skullcaps shouting ha and ho as they kicked and cut and slashed. Then there was Chand, the grave digger, who gave me a guided tour of all the graves in the compound, pointing to the many empty ones and saying those were advanced booking. <laughs> One day, a woman in a burqa who had taken up residence in Mona's house and who spent nearly an hour every day putting on some very stunning makeup, made, she made a business proposal to me. She said, you know, you travel abroad quite often. Why don't you carry some small pouches of diamonds for, for me and deliver them to shops? I'll give you the address, then we can divide the proceeds 50-50. I have to say I was tempted. It would certainly make me more money than a feminist publishing does. But then I thought it wasn't really for me. I met Irfan, a sex worker, who was forced to do the job because his sister had cancer and needed money for her treatment. Irfan would arrive at Mona's every afternoon and stay there till evening drinking himself into a stupor so that he could go out and solicit. And then there was Nayab, a young woman with one leg who'd lost her limb in a train accident and whose artificial limb was stolen when she undid it to sleep at night and kept it beside her. In the morning, it was gone. Mona provided a home and shelter to all these people. They provided company to her, when they, and when they could, they took money from her or made off with whatever was lying around. She lost telephones, mugs, jewelry, and more. She cursed everyone who stole. And yet, they kept coming, and she kept giving them shelter. They called her Baji, sister, nani, grandmother, bua, aunt. And the men called her bhai, brother. She responded to all of these. Over time, as Mona and I became friends, she began to ask me questions as well. Why did I not dye my hair? She still asks me that. And she keeps saying, why don't you dye it? You look 10 years younger. What did it mean to be a feminist? Why had I not married? Did I have a boyfriend? We began to talk, not as researcher and researched, but as two women. I wanted to know about her. What was it about femaleness that had so attracted her? And she made fun of me. One hot summer afternoon, I arrived to find her sitting large and naked on a charpai, a string cot, with a bucket of water at her feet. She was preparing to bathe. Don't be embarrassed, she said to me, seeing the look on my face. We are all women here. I have nothing you don't have. Pointing to different parts of her anatomy and grinning at my discomfiture. <laughs> Another time, she poured me a large whiskey in the afternoon, right by the graveyard as the mullahs walked by. And uh, I was hiding it, and she was drinking hers quite uh, sort of happily. A third time, she asked, me the most difficult mission of all. She asked me if I could bring her breast enhancing cream from Thailand where I was going. And when I said I didn't think it worked on silicon, 
She told me not to bother about all that. She would take care of that. So. The ways in which outside developments impact on marginalized spaces in a city is something those of us who live lives of privilege seldom know. In 2002, after the violence in Gujarat, there was a sudden spurt in surveillance type of activities in Delhi. Elsewhere as well, I imagine. In the area where Mona lives, the police came out in large numbers to, within quotes, document people. They carried questionnaires that they had asked people to fill in, which had all the information about them, including their places of origin, their religion, and so on. One day, sitting in Mona's home, I heard people talking about this. They seemed to be happy, and everyone was filling in forms. Someone brought me one and asked if I could help them fill it in. With my middle-class antennae, I was immediately alarmed. I saw this as a devious mood on, uh, move on the part of the state to try and collect information about people, particularly Muslims, and if they did not find antecedents, they would drive them away. Akbar, for example, the Manikpuri Taekwondo instructor, was really worried and immediately packed his small trunk and went off someplace else. But for everyone else, the filling of forms meant something quite other. They saw it as a way to get the necessary documentation that would allow them to have a legitimate identity. That would enable them to purchase gas cylinders, open bank accounts, and so on and so forth. I realized then how differently we think. Today, the same debate is very much alive in India over something called the Aadhaar card. And many of us are fighting what we see as the state's attempt at surveillance, while the state authorities are laughing at us and saying, well, have you heard of Google? So you don't need to worry about Aadhaar. Yeah. So. In the years that I have known Mona, much has changed in the world of transgenders. Section 377 was read down by the High Court, and for a while, homosexuals, for example, could feel they're not criminals in the eyes of the law. Then this changed when the Supreme Court said the courts did not have the jurisdiction to read down a piece of legislation, and this was something that needed to be looked at by the legislature. So for homosexuals, the Sexual Act once again became illegal. Later, in response to a petition filed by the National Legal Services Authority of, in, uh, of India, NALSA, uh, transgenders were recognized as the third gender. One day, I went from a meeting where this was being discussed with excitement among young queer people, and I took the news to Mona, asking her how she felt about it. She was quite indifferent. I spent my life hoping to be recognized as normal, she said, and now there's a law that sets me apart and gives me that recognition, but I'm not sure if anything will change. Will the law change the way people think, she asked. And she's right, of course. The Indian railways, for example, have announced that they will employ transgender people. There are ways in which the stories of people making the opposite transition that Mona made, I'm, uh, that is, women trans transitioning to the male identity, are becoming public. Advances in medical technologies have ensured that hijras like Mona no longer need to go through backroom castrations. They now have the option of sex reassignment surgery. But will that change the way supposedly normal society deals with them? In Delhi and across much of India, trans persons live on the outskirts of the city. They find it difficult to rent accommodation. Will this change at all? In many ways, in one of those odd paradoxes that life is all about, Mona's constant switching of identity gave her a fluidity, a flexibility that having an official identity will not necessarily allow. While the search for identity has always been the horizon for Mona, she now worries that it may actually be a trap. I mentioned earlier and I, that uh, Mona and I have now become friends, but the friendship too is something of a strange animal. For Mona and the people in Mehindia, I am the Sunday lady. And from being the woman with the red car, I have now become the woman with the blue car because I bought a new car, but even that's been 10 years ago. I go to see Mona every Sunday, as I said. Her life has changed considerably now. Chaman, himself 95 years old, and the hijras no longer come to visit her regularly. They will come every now and again and give her her share of the earnings. Aisha has gone. Also, all her itinerant visitors have also sort of disappeared. A nephew of hers has moved in with her, and he now looks after her, ensuring that she takes her medicines and that she is fed. Mona misses all the people who were once a part of her life. 
While they were there, she never really trusted them. They'd come, she'd give them shelter, then she would find she had lost money, things, clothes, everything that lay around in the open would disappear. She'd find people were ungrateful, they would take what she had to offer, give little in return. But now that they've gone, now that only one or two turn up, she does not know what to do with her time and she misses them. Her nephew wants Mona and himself to move out into a flat somewhere. Mona half dreads that, the once desirable normal life, does not seem so desirable anymore. The thing about friendships, I said that Mona and I have become friends over the years. The thing about friendships is that they are based on the premise of equality. No matter how free they think they are, people seldom build friendships that are not based on this. They seldom cross class barriers. Mona's and my friendship is in this sense a rare gift for me. For me, the ways in which she switches identities from male to female and back again, the ways in which she will call up a different identity to deal with different people are now quite normal. On some Sundays, Nasser, her nephew, and Mona and I talk together. He, he addresses her as him. I speak of her as her. She speaks of herself as we. But all of us know who we are talking about and what we are talking about. But let me go back to the subject of friendship. I've thought a great deal about this since Mona and I have got to know each other. And the thing that is clear to me is this. We are friends, but merely in one direction. I go to see Mona, we meet, we talk, we do not socialize. She hardly ever comes to my home. I take my friends to see her, they love her, but for an afternoon or an hour. What would happen, I wonder, if Mona turned up and joined us for dinner? How would my class of people accept her? Would they be happy to dine with her? What would we talk about? Mona follows none of the rules of conventional rules of social behavior that we are familiar with. She's unkempt, she's loud, she's unbathed, she can sometimes be violent. If she were to act in this way in a public space, how would I deal with that? Would I be embarrassed for her or myself or both? The elephant in the room is the question of class. My going to see Mona is seen as a compassionate gesture on the part of a well-off woman to engage with someone on the margins. Her coming to see me and share my life would be seen as something quite, quite different. I've told you Mona's story, and it's come to you with her blessings. Last Sunday, when I told her I would be speaking here about her, she was delighted, happy that someone would be listening to her story, happy that someone would hear about her life. I want to end this talk by mentioning to you an incident which for me typifies so much of the ambivalence around identity that Mona's life is all about. Some time ago, I took a group of my students to see her. They were doing a project. Oh yes, I teach a course at a university, which I forgot to tell Pushpa, so that's, those are the students. Uh, they were doing a project on transgender identities and they wanted to meet her. Mona was delighted to meet them. She loves people and young people just make her heart glad. They spent a couple of hours together and the kids asked her lots of questions which she answered. And then one of them asked her a question I have never had the courage to ask. He said to her, when you look back on your life now, what do you think? Are you happy you made the move to being a woman? And Mona's answer was, look at me here alone, with no one to call my own. Sometimes I think that if I had remained a man, I would have had a wife, a family, someone to call my own, someone to be with me in old age. I no longer know if I did the right thing. It broke my heart to hear her say that. But I realized, too, how the failure to find happiness in what she was seeking was not Mona's fault alone but also the fault of people like me, like us who lead normal lives and for whom there is little space for the other. But let me not end on a note of despair. So the happy story to come out of this is that the student who asked her that question soon after was able to come out himself as a trans person and he wrote to me and told me that it was his encounter with Mona that had given him the courage to be who he really was. Thank you for listening.
Thank you. Does that mean you were not bored? <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Uh, we have a little bit of time for Q&A, and there is a rowing mic that Laura's very um, nicely uh, managing. So uh, we're very happy to take some questions and answers for uh, questions for Urushi and possible answers. <laughs> if there are any answers. Who would like to go first? Thank you very much for um, over here for the incredible talk. I also have been thinking about this one-sidedness. I mean, in some ways, even the talk itself lets us know her so intimately, and she won't know any of us. She won't know these people who now know her so or think that they know some aspects of her life so well. So I've been thinking about it in the context of all of these books that are now coming out about trying to understand the so-called red states, not to over-talk about the U.S., but the idea that, oh, if, if we have sociologists and anthropologists follow people who live in Louisiana or other places and tell their stories, that the so-called rest of us will then better understand them. And I guess I'm just wondering, in your opinion, is it ever two-sided? Are, are there two-sided spaces or moments that, that you can think of, or even one-sided in the other way? Um, you know, I think there's two or three things there in, in what you're saying. Um, first of all, I think that there is no way in which the capacity, willingness, um, okay, the capacity and the willingness to listen to people's stories should not be there among us, okay? And um, so this business of talking to people, um, I think it's really important because it writes a balance in the writing uh, or in the understanding of societies. If we try to understand that societies are not only about the elite, but also are much more layered and, uh, and that, say, even in the context of the, the broad rubric of this talk, that uh, the ways in which people on the margins live inside in cities, it's important to under, understand that. But there is a question that I think many of us have not been able to answer, which is the question of how this interaction can ever be work both ways, and how it cannot be exploitative, and how, to put it another way, Suppose Mona had been Dhirubhai Ambani, would I have dared to do something like this? Obviously not. Suppose um, Mona had been Tina Ambani, would she have let me into her life in the same way? Obviously not. So um, there is a sense in which um, many books like this come out, which look at, or many works like this, which look at the poor subject in an intimate kind of way, and which I think are extremely valuable in one way, but um, need to be self-reflective and questioning about the role that you're playing and the way class enters it and so on. Um, I am, I, I mean, I, in this discussion with Mona, this is what holds me back from writing the book about her that she wanted me to write and that I said I would write. There are many other things that hold me back. One of them is, um, you know, how do you write about a living person? And that person's uh, expectations from what you would write about her and your, the truth of what you might want to write may be two different things. So how do you deal with, with all of these things? But uh, certainly I think the fact that in our equation, Mona has been able to uh, raise as many questions with me about the kind of life I lead and what that means to me as I have to her, m makes this for me a, a better interaction than one where she would just be the, that dreadful word that she was a native informant or, or whatever uh, you might call it. Uh, and also we have an agreement. I never speak about her without her permission. And uh, whenever, she, I mean, she, whenever I'm speaking about her anywhere or writing about her anywhere, if I earn any money, it's shared half with her. She never asks me to show the accounts because she trusts me, but, but I could be cheating her through and through, um, but I hope I'm not. 
So I, I don't know what you know how one can ever have a, a proper answer, but you can at least try to make the interaction more egalitarian, more honest um, than uh, it may be on the on the surface. That's the best I guess one can do. I don't know if that answers your question, but maybe it addresses it in some way. Yes. If I do write it, it will be co-written. I mean, I mean, in the sense that uh, her name will be on on it, and uh, what royalties will be shared. But she doesn't write. I mean, she writes a little in Urdu, and she's written parts which I will use. But so, she reads English, but she won't read the book. I know that. I mean, she'll read bits of it, but she won't read it. So I could write anything, and I could, you know, she might be co-authoring something that she doesn't want to be part of. So once again, I can tell myself that that's. Yes, but uh, we, I, I stopped taping the conversations about 10 years ago because we just became friends and we started talking, which is also what makes it very difficult to write. You know, we talk, and the talks are in my head, and the discussions are in my head, so um, I don't know. I mean, co-writing is an answer, but again, it's not... Um, I think there's a question there first, and then a question here. Yes, I very, very found your talk very inspiring. Um, I uh, wondered, one of the things that's been happening in uh, Anglo-European um, debate has been uh, second wave feminism, um, seeing uh, trans women as being men invading women's spaces, and that's something you alluded to in the conversation by uh, the Lesbian Feminine Australian. And I wondered whether how trans women and that debate about real women was playing out within Indian feminism. Hmm. It is a discussion in Indian feminism, uh, but mainly because of the very contentious discussions that have taken place in the West about this. Um, to, to some extent, the only people in India who are actually making space for transgenders, trans women, particularly are the feminists, are the feminists, but there are, you know, there are moments when these discussions become really important. The first time it actually came up uh, uh, in the public space was in a women's conference in Calcutta, I think about 10 or 12 years back, I don't remember, one of the big conferences that we have every four or five years, um, where for the first time transgenders were part of the conference. But the nature of those conferences is that they, they are unfunded and activists pay for them. And um, so you, we, we normally would hire a, a school or a college or something in the holidays, and people sleep on mattresses on the floor. Uh, and the issue came up about transgenders sleeping there with many of the feminists saying, but these are guys, and this is an all-woman thing, and we don't allow men to sleep in here. So how can we allow these men to sleep in here? So it was a very um, difficult moment that for the feminist movement. I don't quite remember how it got resolved, but I think that they did not sleep in that space. But today, if that happened, there would be a slightly different, a more inclusive take on it. So the, it's an issue that's there, but it's not upfront in the way that that strong debate has been there in the West. But it's not an issue that's going to go away easily. Question there, and I'll come to um, Hi, my name is Shalu, and I'm from Matra. It's a place very close to Delhi in India. And my question is, uh, would the story of Mona, um, ha like, would her story be different had she been in a different religion, say a Hindu rather than a Muslim? And why I ask this is because, um, like, I perceive that the issues of transgender, like, or her story can easily be extended to, like, the gays and the lesbians in India, and how it it closely like gets like messed up with the uh, like religious tenets and and the issues around family structure and those thanks i don't think it would have been that different if she had uh, if she had been hindu instead of muslim uh, is that's what you were that's what your initial question was um you know they i don't know if you read this the, uh, book the two rather wonderful books written by a trans, trans woman called Revati, 
One is called The Truth About Me, and the second one is called A Life in Transactivism. And Revati is a Hindu from Tamil Nadu, and um, the life is as as difficult. The struggle she's had is really difficult. And Revati, unlike Mona, has tried to make a place for herself in the NGO world, working with other transgenders, and it's been really tough on her. And then there is this uh, very flamboyant uh, woman called Lakshmi Tripathi, who is an upper caste Hindu woman who is uh, transgender. And she is, again, uh, she's had a difficult life. The, the caste situation didn't help her very much. But uh, Lakshmi is one of the petitioners in the NALSA petition to get recognition for uh, transgenders, the third gender thing. So I don't think that religion in this case uh, trumps over sexuality. I don't think so. Yeah, I do, I'm saying I don't think it would have been more difficult. Not from the examples I know, but then maybe on a wider scale it might be, but I, I am not aware of those. Um, <clears throat> Mona's daughter, Aisha? Aisha. Aisha. It's, it sounds like she's estranged from her. Mm. And the only um, comment that you gave us about it was to do with, you know, understanding her own body and how she had no kind of resonance. There was no resonance in the household in which she grew up. Was there not more to it than that? Was there anything else that... Because she was brought up by Mona, right? Mm, mm, mm. And Mona says that she's now alone. Mm. So I was wondering what happened to Was Aisha. there not more between them? Why did Aisha take her own path and, in a sense, abandon Mona? Are you recording this? So can I answer that question afterwards when the recording is done? Yeah. I don't want to make her life, in, in that sense, out on YouTube or something. Uh, it's a question related to the uh, lady there in terms of <clears throat> just trying to understand if the Hijra community is divided along religious lines in India. Is the Hijra community divided along religious lines? Not that I know of. Okay, so, um, you know, I sh should have said that my work is not on the Hijra community. It is, I'm really just looking at Mona and Mona's life but through that trying to understand issues of sexuality, citizenship, and all of that. But in the process of um, working with Mona, I've come to know uh, bits, of, you know, some things about the Hijra community, but I'm not a scholar of that. Um, but the, uh, as far as I know, the Hijra community is not divided along religious lines. In the north of India, many Hijras who may not actually originally be Muslim would adopt the Muslim identity if their guru is Muslim and they would follow the guru. Uh, some retain the Hindu identity. In the south of India, a lot of hijras are Hindus. But they don't have a battle with each other uh, and they don't adopt, within quotes, communal lines um, along religious identities, no. If there is any, uh, I mean, they, uh, there are turf battles those have to do more with money and those have to do with um, profession, I mean, where they can make more money and that sort of thing. But uh, as far as I know, they're not divided along communal lines. I could be completely wrong. Somebody who's studied hijras much more deeply may be able to tell you, but as far as I know, no. Uh, I didn't necessarily mean to ask whether they're sort of divided in terms of uh, they're antagonistic to each other just that whether <clears throat> if you are, as you said, uh, you know, born Hindu or Muslim and you join a family or a guru mm -hmm. is of a particular religion, do you have to adopt that or your, your religious identity is completely separate from your identity as a hijra or the hijra family that you belong to? Sorry, you're saying that if you are Hindu or Muslim and you join a guru who is, uh, say, Muslim, you have to or is your identity determined by the guru or the family you belong to? Yes, or that you would join a particular hijra community in Delhi because you're Muslim 
as against another Hijra community in Delhi, which is... Oh, sort of okay, 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 I understand that. Um, I think not that I know of the joining of communities and the choosing of gurus is a really a matter of either choice sometimes and sometimes um, you know somebody you know will draw you into a particular community and you will a particular group and you will go there uh, and then you'll adopt the whatever the religion of the guru is but I don't think that if you are born a Hindu you might choose a Hindu guru no I don't think so I, I mean you might do that if the guru you choose happens to be Hindu, you know, but you wouldn't choose a guru because he or she is Hindu. As again, as far as I know, no, but it's right, actually, I, mean, I'm, I just wanted to say that hmm. it's 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 there. There are two or three things in because I I I have to say first that I'm one of the person I'm one of the person who met you in Mona's in Mona's place house, yeah. and the Dart organization you went uh, mm. I was running that small group which you were is running shut, that which is shut thrice by okay, government yeah. because of the corruption now yes. there's no funding and the, sh mm. the center is shut mm. and uh, also I want to tell I mean the anxiety you have over the sharing the stories of people is that they are people who kind of came on the other side of the line now and uh, I am myself doing PhD and uh, I am writing about Jugnu and the Dharmendra and the Ashus and the, uh, so many others yes. and uh, so yeah so I, w I wanted to say that is uh, uh, it's that one thing is that uh, if you're born in that area and if that area is uh, uh, run by a Muslim guru, so you, it's automatically you adopt that guru yeah. instead of going to some other area because you will go into uh, upper level of hierarchy because you're born in that particular area. Otherwise, you, it's, a choice, it's a matter of choice. You go and then you wanted to join some other area or mostly people go to different cities basically because they are all migrants. Hmm. So there's hmm. another something which yes, is uh, yeah. because they are migrant. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and the functioning is um, is more lucrative yeah. and, in the city. And 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 there are so many Hindus like me who have eaten beef at Mona's place or some other places. So <laughs> so there's, and it's it's all. Don't say it, it out loud. They'll arrest you in Delhi. And it's 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 uh, it's all <laughs> mixed. Uh, Uh, hello, yes. Um, the question I have is, what advice would you have to those who, for example, refuse to listen? So I come from a culture where if I bring up transgender rights, the immediate response will be, we don't have any. So in, in a way, how is your work affected with how you interact with others? How is the work affected? Um... With how you interact with others. So let's say you saw something that touched you or you thought was quite emotional and you decided that you wanted to change opinions? Um, yeah. I'm not sure I understand. I didn't, I mean, I didn't go into uh, the interaction with Mona mm -hmm. to think I could change anything because, is that what you're asking? Yes, that's what I'm asking. No, I mean, I, I think if I had done that, I would have been very suspicious of myself. I don't think I think it's wrong. You can't, you know, you, uh, as far as I'm concerned, change. I know it sounds like uh, statements that Gandhi made, which sometimes I object to, but change has to begin with yourself and you can only change yourself. And um, you can't really, who am I to go into Mona's life and try to change her? Mona knows her life best. She knows what she wants. What I went into Mona's life because she asked me if I would come and write a book and I was excited and intrigued at this opportunity and I thought, oh yeah, you know, I thought to myself, great, it'll be a book about transgenders, there isn't a book like this in India, it'll be an interesting book. I'm publisher enough to know what could be an interesting book and, uh, and the interaction became something completely other, you know, it became, it became a friendship and it and I've learned so much from it. And now my worry is not that, I mean, now my worry is, am I right to tell this story? I mean, can, ought I to put it into a book? And um, would, will I be violating her uh, privacy, her rights? I'm here talking to you, but as I said, I'm talking to you 
with her permission and I can take these steps but I can't bring myself to take the step of, of actually doing a book because once it's out there, it's out there in, uh, in print or in whatever form. But I would never think of going into uh, I don't mean changing her, I mean changing how society may look at us. So let's say oh, if you had a friend. changing how... Uh, no, again, I didn't um, go into that thinking that. But yes, if the work helps to contribute in some way to the way society thinks of transgender people as something other, then yes, I think. Because yes, that's what we feminists do. We want to change society, right? And we want to change the way society thinks about women and, and so on. So I'm not denying that motive. And yes, if it does contribute to that, yes. Thank you. There's a question all the way in the back up there, Laura. Hi. Uh, so you spoke about Mona's aspiration for a normal life. And what I wanted to ask was, um, did she also have an aspiration for voice and visibility? And if yes, what you do here today, is that a way to fulfill that aspiration for her? And what could be other ways to do that? Yeah, she did very much um, have uh, want to be heard and want to be visible. Uh, some of it was possible for her through Dayanita Singh, who is a photographer who has extensively photographed Mona. And uh, Dayanita was the one, as I said, who introduced me to Mona. And, um, you know, when Dayanita first uh, went in and took photos of Mona um, and of the other hijras that Mona lived and worked with, she... Um, was one of the earliest people in India certainly to do that. But Mona requested her not to make those pictures public because she was worried about um, how it would sit with the other hijras. And because there was already tension within the community, she didn't want to sort of upset things. And Dayanita respected that for many, many years until Mona herself felt that she could now publish, and she did publish a book called uh, Myself, Mona Ahmed, with some rather stunning photos of Mona. And Mona has now um, formed part of Danita's, very, very important, significant part of Danita's work, um, wherever she exhibits that. I mean, Sunil sitting here knows that. Uh, he's also a stunning photographer. So, um, and I think that that has been very, uh, in many ways, very important for Mona, quite empowering for her, but also problematic because it does set her apart from the community and she is still tied to the community and reliant on them in some ways for at least the little bit of money that she gets. Uh, so it, it does create that, that kind of tension a little bit. And um, after Danita's uh, photos were published, Mona was widely interviewed on television and other places, and stories were published about her in uh, National Geographic and various other places. And like everyone, she enjoyed the importance and visibility that gave her. And uh, it also had this little backlash with, uh, with her community. Um, now, every now and again, she says, I really don't care about the community. You know, it's, you can publish what you like. At least my story will be heard. Uh, so yes, the short answer to that is yes. I think we have time for one more question. Ah. Um, since you have mentioned about Lakshmi Tripathi, mm -hmm. there's two types of hijras that I could see. Mona, who is part of the margin, mm -hmm. and Lakshmi, mm -hmm. who is in the center. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask, how does class influence social inclusiveness in contemporary India? Does that make a difference with regards to hijras' lives? 
I think class influences social inclusiveness and exclusiveness everywhere in the world. No matter that Marx is out of the door in many places, but class hasn't gone away. No? So whether we are talking about hijras or we are talking about race or we are talking about caste or we are talking about poverty or all sorts of issues, class is really central to it. I don't think that it goes away that easily. Lakshmi's being so visible and vocal has to do, of course, with Lakshmi being a uh, Tripathi, which is an upper caste, upper caste person. It has to do uh, a bit with Lakshmi's own personality, which is a very, very different personality from Mona's. So you, if you put Lakshmi into a public gathering of a thousand people and ask her to dance, she will get up and dance and sing and be flamboyant. Uh, Mona won't, I don't think. So I think it has to do with that as well. Um, so I suppose, I mean, the, the basic thing there definitely is class, but Lakshmi's class, while it allows her entry, it uh, does not, uh, I mean, there is also her, the question of her being a, a trans person, a hijra, which then makes people a little uh, distant from her. So while people might allow her entries to their parties, I don't think she has a lot of friends who will go out shopping with her or something like that. Uh, so there is a way in which that that barrier doesn't get so easily crossed by class. You're, you're raising your hand, you want to say something? It's also to do with the, because Lakshmi came through in, in the world through HIV programs. Yeah. So that's very different, different, she entry already point, made entry yes. point and yes. La Mona, whereas she comes from a traditional hijra. And long before. And long be much, yeah. much long yeah. before. So I think that's the kind of like different, yeah. and now Lakshmi is in UN and Everything, everywhere. So yes. it's a very different exposure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, now the whole question, um, of, there, there is a way in which the HIV, uh, the uh, campaign against HIV AIDS in India opened up the question of queer identities very radically and in a very broad-based way. But there is a way in which queer people, uh, especially transgender people, got drawn into that whole UN framework and everything. And that's a very different world from the world in which uh, Mona functioned, and also a very different world from the world in which someone like Revati functions, you know, who's uh, from the transgender person from Tamil Nadu. I mean, uh, Revati is not r really um, literate in the way that Lakshmi is. She's not upper class. So she would never be pulled into the UN network. You know, she'd be, they'd worry about her. So a lot of things, I guess, add up. Yeah. Well, I have the last question about translation. <laughs> My question, not only really a question, but I mean to pick up from what you said about the problematics around translation and class. Mm. How do you describe in an academic English way mm -hmm. what Mona's experience is and what the UN activists and middle class English speaking ones, I should hasten to add, mm. What they have done in India in the last 20 years is to take indigenous, Hindi-speaking, non-English-speaking people's mm -hmm. sexual problems and re-describe it back to them using English, using a global UN kind of language, which is foreign to the very people it's being applied to. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, is it even possible for us to understand it, given this mm -hmm. back and forth of the language mm -hmm. in English? Mm -hmm which is often the language of mm. power and privilege and activism. Mm. Mm. I don't know. I mean, that's not really a uh, question I can answer. And that's, you didn't really ask it as a question. But it made me think of one little thing, which I will uh, just mention to you. Because Mona speaks a bit of English, right? And um, she understands a reasonable amount of it. She'll speak a broken English. So she loves saying, taking the word eunuch, in English, and she says, I am unique. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that, because she is. <laughs> no doubt about that. 
Well, so, I think, as I said in the introduction, the whole point was to get an activist amongst the academics and let the cat out amongst the pigeons. But it's, it's been more phenomenal than that. And I loved your question about the language. In the language, yeah. So I think there's room for much more discussion. But unfortunately, we have to draw the evening to a close. So please join me in thanking Urvashi for this fantastic talk. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. positive way you've left us unfulfilled because we have so many more questions so in that way I, I can't thank you enough so thank you so much for giving this keynote for the city's imaginary uh, sandwich. Thank you for having me here really it was something. Yeah. <laughs>